Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first Women's Voices Zoom Lunch and Learn. We've had almost 100 people sign up to join us today, and we're thrilled to have every one of you. Our speaker, Percy Green, probably doesn't need a lot of introduction to most of us. He is one of the most noted social justice advocates in the St. Louis area, and in his work, he has accomplished things that were both newsworthy and produced results. In 1964, he climbed up the leg of the Gateway Arch, which was then under construction to protest the exclusion of blacks from federal contracts and jobs related to the construction of the arch. This resulted in changes in hiring practices. And today, a photo of Percy Green hangs in the arch to commemorate his dramatic action. In 1972, Percy Green was responsible for coordinating an action that resulted in the unmasking of the Veiled Prophet during one of the Veiled Prophet balls. This was quite a newsworthy event, and in subsequent years, the VP organization actually has changed from to become perhaps a little less exclusive and more community-oriented. Percy Green was also a plaintiff in Green versus McDonnell Douglas, a fair employment case that went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. This case, which dealt with racial discrimination under a pretext by an employer, is believed to be one of the most cited case laws in the United States. Percy Green holds degrees from St. Louis University and Washington University, and he believes in acts of civil disobedience because he knows that they can result in positive change. So here he is today to tell us all polite, law-abiding folks that we are who are fed up with just about everything how we can raise hell in our communities in order to make them a better place to live and to work for everybody. If you want, Percy is going to talk for 10 or 15 minutes and describe some of the work that he has done and the work that he is involved in today. If you have questions, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and then we will moderate those questions for Percy Green later in the program. We are very pleased to have him with us today. Applaud in your heart. I want to thank you very much, uh, Barbara French, Finch, Finch, am I pronouncing that correctly, uh, for the opportunity to uh, share with the audience uh, uh, some brain stretching exercises as it relates uh, to civil disobedience um, and protests. Um, I would like to respond mainly uh, to uh, questions. So I'll just give you a thumbnail sketch as to uh, how, action com how action came into being. Um, after a major dispute uh, in terms of strategy and tactics with uh, an organization that I was with by the name, uh, by the name of CORE, uh, we broke away to form uh, uh, this other organization that was called Action. And the rationale for breaking away was that uh, we had a divide in the organization. Uh, some of the members felt as if that the, the strategy to use to bring about change was, um, uh, <clears throat> would be uh, uh, a community action. Saul Alinsky in Chicago was, uh, was given a great deal of credit for organizing communities and for those uh, 
community participants to bring pressure on the political establishment. Uh, CORE at the time, we just finished a protest demonstration at Jefferson Bank uh, to the tune of um, getting them, or persuading them to hire four black telephone, I mean, four black uh, tellers. And so coming off of that, many of the members who was involved in that six month uh, struggle felt that direct action protests or civil disobedience, if you will, uh, was no longer useful. And <clears throat> about 25 of us felt to, the, uh, felt to the contrary. We felt that the only way that you're going to really um, um, bring about uh, real change is to engage in uh, acts of civil disobedience, which is a, a nonviolent protest, but it does, um, it, it, it disrupts. And so that's uh, what we decided to do. Uh, we broke away, we uh, organized ourselves um, as being a interracial, nonviolent, volunteer protest organization. And uh, this took place in 1965. Um, and our first uh, projects uh, was the, um, uh, the arch, super, uh, uh, this was super, t this was, uh, uh, we, were, <clears throat> we were actually organizing within CORE, but we did not announce our organization as being a bona fide organization until uh, the spring of 1965. Um, <clears throat> the targets that we decided to uh, go after was large businesses. We felt as if that uh, the, the effort that was put forth related to Jefferson Banks for four jobs uh, was not uh, well spent. We felt that if we were going to engage in civil disobedience and going to jail, it should be worthy of the effort. And so therefore, we've decided that we would demand of our subjects 10% of the jobs. Why 10%? 10% because at that time, the population of blacks in the city of St. Louis was was 10%. So we felt as if that we deserved 10% of the job. So that was our barometer. At that, uh, we went after, we wanted <clears throat> uh, another characteristic of our efforts was we wanted, uh, we, we were going after jobs that paid a decent salary and we focused in primarily jobs for black males black men, the family chief breadwinner. Uh, we noticed that uh, during this particular period, whenever there was a protest relating to blacks, the companies would hire females in clerical type uh, jobs. So therefore, we thought that it would become highly uh, effective for us to make sure that we identify the jobs that we were primarily after. We still wanted jobs for females, for black females, of course, but we honed in on more and better paying jobs for black males, the family chief breadwinner. And we, um, our target, we targeted uh, Southwestern Bell, LeCleed Gas, and Union Electric Company. Uh, those companies at the time, they had um, in the area of uh, six to 7,000 jobs. And then of course, 10% uh, of those jobs uh, made our demands uh, be somewhere uh, in the hundreds, 600 here, 500 there, and, and, uh, and uh, maybe 700 at, a, at, at, a, at another, uh, 
another one of the companies. So um, that was, uh, and so therefore we felt as if that uh, our demonstration had to be effective. And what do I mean by that? I mean that we would have to um, uh, execute the type of demonstration that would um, get the, the press to come out, and then at the same time, um, of course, the demonstrations would be nonviolent, and uh, it would also bring pressure upon the adversary. And it goes like this: We felt as if civil disobedience would be just like a, a double-edged sword. On one side of the sword. Uh, the cutting edge would be to inform the community at large that something is going, that something is wrong with this particular subject, meaning the particular company. And then on the other side of the sword, uh, it would mean that uh, it would be effective enough to arouse the concern of the chief executive officer of the company. And so that's what we meant when we used the term that it had to be effective uh, as a double-edged sword. Um, so that's pretty much uh, was the thesis of action. We wanted to be effective, and we were primarily going after uh, a job for black males. And then, of course, um, uh, the rest is history. How? How did we come up uh, with various uh, demonstrations? Well, we, uh, we met often. We had, regular, um, we had regular meetings. We had regular meetings and the um, um, weekly meetings. And at those meetings, uh, we discussed uh, various, uh, uh, we were updated as to what was going on in the community, plus uh, we wanted to be um, uh, effective, I mean, well, we wanted to monitor the effects of our demonstrations. So that's, um, and then of course, then of course, it become very important for us to recruit as well. By having weekly meetings, that gave rise to a lot of people who was curious, who wanted to sit in, sit in on the meetings. Uh, was welcome to do so and uh, learn about uh, what we had done, why we had executed the type of demonstrations that we did. So um, that's pretty much how we um, came into being. And uh, I would like to respond to whatever questions that one would like to, uh, to raise. Uh, keep in mind now, the thesis of actions activities, and I believe this to this day, and that is uh, effectiveness. Um, I can't say that enough. We wanted the demonstration to be effective, and effective in, 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 uh, to the extent that it will move people out of their comfort zone. Uh, that becomes very, very important. Um, and then, of course, it's very enlightened to the participant as well. Uh, they get a, especially if you are arrested, uh, you get a chance to learn firsthand uh, about the corruption that goes on in the judiciary system, the so-called justice system. And then, of course, on the, at that point, uh, at this point, I would just uh, like to respond to, to whatever questions that one might to that would like to raise at, the, at this point. Okay, Percy, can you describe a little bit, talk a little bit about being arrested and what that was, is like? And most of us don't have a clue what happens. Um, and we do know that it's probably better to call the criminal justice system the criminal injustice, <laughs> injustice system. system. But Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, civil disobedience uh, requires uh, disruption to the extent that is a high probability that one would be arrested. And of course, um, 
the arrest, let's say, for instance, at the time that we uh, climbed the arch, well, we was trespassing. We knew that we were not supposed to be on the, on the, uh, uh, the arch and while they were constructed it, but we had to develop uh, uh, a way to get there on the arch and then become a nuisance or become disruptive. So um, Daly and I, uh, there in um, 1964, we thought that we would go and case the place, go and see whether or not we could walk on the, on the ground and then walk up to the arch and touch it. So about, uh, this took place about two weeks before we actually climbed the arch because we had to report back to the group that the climbing of the arch was doable. The only way we could determine whether it was doable or not is that, is that we would actually put forth the effort to try to go on the ground, see can we go up to the, to the arch, the, uh, the portion there that had the ladder that, that, uh, that we could possibly climb up of the arch. So we had to do that. So, so how did that come about? Well, we thought that the best chance that we could, could determine whether we could climb the, uh, the arch would be uh, if we would go and run the test at, uh, at lunchtime. Most of the workers would be at work. They would be in a re relaxed state. They would be as mindful of, uh, of things while they were eating lunch. And so sure enough, Daly and I, at, uh, at 12 o'clock at uh, noon, uh, a few weeks before we actually climbed the arch, walked on the grounds, walked right past the workers, walked up, touched the, uh, the arch, touched the ladder that we were contemplating on climbing, and then walked off of the grounds, out of the area. No one said anything. So we came back to the group and reported to the group that, hey, we think that that, that, that is doable. So we then worked the strategy in terms of contacting a bonds person that on such and such a day be on standby because it's high probability that we're going to have two of our members arrested. That's one, that's one thing we had to make a the other is that we had to develop a, a diversionary, a decoy, to get the press to come out. And to get the press to come out, but at the same time, get, to utilize the press in such a way that they would not tip off the authorities about what we were, going, what we were about to do. So we called the press, told the press that we were going to be picketing at the old court building. Uh, we were going to have a big uh, picket line there and that we were picketing because we wanted jobs. So, and then we told the press that there's a high probability that there are going to be some people arrested uh, somewhere in the vicinity of the old courthouse. So the press came out. <clears throat> and then, of course, after, on the day that we actually climbed the arch, uh, we, <clears throat> Dale and I, we visited the grounds as we did a couple of weeks ago, the same process, walked right past the workers while they were at work, uh, at lunch, and then we began to start climbing the ladder, the ladder up the, the north uh, leg. And about, oh, I guess after about 10 or 15 feet up the ladder, we heard some of the workers say, hey, hey, what are you doing? Well, it was too late then. We was already on the line. <laughs> and so we, the, the arch at that point was at the 300-foot point where we wanted to climb uh, as high as we could but leave a, a, a large margin between where we were and where they were actually working. We, had to, we, we carefully uh, planned that out as we uh, uh, on this particular day. I wanted to make sure that I was not close enough to the workers in the event that there was an accident, then uh, for them to be able with credibility to say that we had something to do with it. So we left a, a larger enough uh, uh, distance 
uh, between where we were and where the workers were. The workers were at the 300-foot mark. We climbed to the 125-foot mark. So that was a decent enough gap between. So in the event one of the workers had, would have had an accident, they could very well say that we, we, we were so close to them that we, that we caused it, you know. Uh, after we had reached the point on the arch, we then signaled to the old court building that we had been successful and that for the spokesperson at the, uh, at the old court house um, could tell the press that we were there on the arch in protest. And that's what they did and that's how they brought the press over to the grounds um, where, we, where we were up on the arch. Now we told, we told them at the arch that we were gonna be there until they hire 1,000 black employees in all job classification. And then of course, they didn't know what time uh, that, we were, we, that we were going to end the demonstration. I was working at McDonnell Douglas at the time in the capacity of a research and development technician. And so I had to be, I had to uh, come down and I knew that I was going to be arrested, be arrested, bonded out of jail, and uh, therefore g giving me time enough to get home, shower, and be at work at 12 o'clock that night. And so that's what, <laughs> that was all part of the planning as well. So we climbed the arch at, five, at uh, 12 o'clock. We didn't come down until about 5.30. It was 5.30 that we came down. The moment that we came down, to show you another moment of racism. Um, <clears throat> if I was the first one to climb the arch, then uh, Daly, was, uh, Daly was my partner, he was white. Uh, that meant that he, was, uh, he, would be, he would be the second one. Then if we were descending, then he would be the first. Well, as he, <laughs> at 5.30 when we came down, uh, they did not place him under arrest. They placed me under arrest immediately. And then upon me being uh, uh, arrested, I went limp because I refused to walk to jail because the, my thinking was that, that the, the builders of the arch, the builder of the arch was, was, uh, was in a greater violation of human rights than whatever charges that they were trying to bring on me as, as, as it relates to me breaking the law. So um, I refused to, um, uh, to walk to jail and therefore they had to bring the stretches out because the press was there. They never would have brought the stretches and everything out had the press not been there. And so when they brought the press, uh, when they brought the, uh, the stretches, then they put me on it. My partner, Daly, was still standing up because they hadn't placed him under arrest. The moment that they placed him under arrest, he too went limp and therefore they had to take him away. Um, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Nicholas Kassenbach was the Attorney General. He dropped all of the charges against us. They had us uh, charged with individual, individual peace disturbance, general peace disturbance, and resisting arrest. Um, now, did I take too long with that, with that, with that answer, <laughs> with that no, response? No, that's a fascinating story. Oh. Um, we have a number of questions here, okay. so I'm just going to start at the top and work my way down. The first one is from Mary Clemens, and her question is, Walter Johnson in The Broken Heart of America says you used humor in your protests. Is there any way to lighten the mood in a protest today to help bring about change? Uh, yes, <clears throat> yes. Uh, humor, if you can, um uh, if you can uh, institute such, I mean, that's always uh, good because usually if, you, uh, uh, if you're hampering a person from, from doing something that they had, expect had the expectation of doing, and then all of a sudden uh, they're prevented from doing it, quite naturally anger will uh, emerge uh, first and foremost. But then, of course, 
uh, shortly thereafter, uh, if by chance there is, uh, uh, they can see also that there was a, that there is some humor involved, then that, that, dis, that disarmed the hostility, and then at the same time, it brings about uh, uh, thought. Uh, I think uh, a lot of times that's what make uh, comedians uh, very effective uh, uh, in many cases because they can force people to think about things that they would necessarily ordinarily think about in certain ways. And uh, uh, in, my, uh, uh, in, in our acts of civil disobedience and whatnot, if, if, if it's all possible to, uh, to strike a note of, um, of humor in some manner, we certainly uh, attempt to do such. You're aware that um, the people who were not at the veiled prophet ball when you, the prophet was unmasked thought that that whole exploit was very humorous. Yes. Yeah. And that's probably why we remember it so, yeah. high, so yeah. well. Yes. Now, I mean, that was, uh, uh, that, was uh, that took a great deal of, uh, of skill. But it also, I would have to commend our active participants because they had been involved with action for a while and have seen how action execute demonstrations, things of that nature. In other words, uh, Jane Sauer and um, Gina Scott. Uh, Gina Scott had uh, been arrested before. Uh, no, let's see, I, I can't remember whether she was arrested. I think she might have been arrested again afterwards. But anyway, Gina uh, and uh, they have seen uh, action involved in other acts of civil disobedience, so therefore uh, they were not shocked in being arrested. Uh, they knew what would happen. And they also knew that uh, we, we were organized to the extent that um, they would be bonded out and they also knew that we, would, we had um, attorneys who were going to argue the case if and whenever it came, um, came up in court. And as it turned out, uh, during the Ville Prophet uh, situation, since they demanded to see the accuser, who was, who was Tom K. Smith, uh, the Ville Prophet of that, of that year, uh, they were so embarrassed, so they dropped the charges because they still want to lead the community that the VP was not discovered, he was not uh, made public uh, during this particular uh, episode, you know. They still, see, during that particular time, they refused to identify uh, that which was obvious at the time because they wanted to maintain their so-called secrecy of the VP. It was the only newspaper that, uh, that identified it was uh, the St. Louis Journalism Review. Uh, Charles uh, Klotzer, uh, he was in charge of the, news, of, the pa of the paper at the time. He was the only newspaper uh, that, uh, that identified uh, the VP at that, uh, <coughs> that time, during, uh, that year, you know. But it goes to show you how the press plays a role in what happens in the community and what they know, uh, misinformation, and so forth. How that is utilized, you know, how when, when we talk about the white power structure, it becomes important for people to understand what we're talking about. We're talking about the news media, uh, the people that owns and control the news media, how that uh, uh, ties in with the big businesses who uh, provide uh, employment and do the building and uh, the, the whole network, you know. So that leads into this next question, which is, who are some of the targets we should be looking at today in order to make the changes that we need? Okay, I think that the, the targets, of course, I think should, are the same as they were even then, because when I talk about 
the white power structure, those businesses, the chief executive officers of large businesses, your, 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 your political structure, uh, the people that are uh, in decision-making capacities, um, <clears throat> they still exist. Um, and I think that one of the main things that I've been advocating here recently is it's amazing that we have so many senior citizens who, um, who have uh, called me and talked to me over, over a period of, uh, of uh, years about what is it that seniors can do? And I say, hey, it's a whole lot that seniors can do if there is a will of wanting to, to carry on uh, some actions. So I came up with a program called the Boo Crew. And there, therefore, I would, uh, I would, uh, I think this, uh, this is a, an effort, a comprehensive uh, effort that would involve any number of seniors who would like to participate. And it goes like this, you know, pretty much. Let's say, for instance, there is something that, uh, an issue. You, you, one can name an issue and I can apply this. So let's say, for instance, it's an issue of, uh, of, uh, of, let's say, for instance, the school. Let's say, for instance, folks feel as if that as a result of this pandemic, that, they, that, they, that, that until there is some absolute control in the area, that there should not be any schools. So let's say, for instance, they're going to have some sort of gathering or meeting to discuss such. And let's say, for instance, you're going to have an advocate there who's going to try to force the schools to open even though there is no evidence that they have this coronavirus under any control. Why open up the schools and subject the kids to such and there is no control over the virus? Uh, so, and let's say for instance, you're gonna have some, uh, you're gonna have a turkey who's gonna try to say, well, we'll have it under control and all of the other, they're gonna, do all of this mumbo jumbo, this political mumbo jumbo. So I would think that this would be an ideal chance, let's say for instance, for some seniors to come and wherever venue that this, that this, uh, that this uh, gathering is gonna be, that the seniors will come and then as this uh, spokesperson from the establishment try to or rather spill to mislead the people about how safe it's going to be and what all they're going to do and all of this other, that you would have some seniors that would get up and boo, 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 you know. Now, now that's a demonstration that, that uh, will be very upsetting to the power structure, especially if they're seniors. So what are they going to do to the seniors? All they can do is possibly go to, and ask the, the senior or try to escort them off of the premises. Now, if you got the press there, the press is going to print that during the, during this, uh, during the speech or the spill of the superintendent who was trying to uh, uh, explain to the, uh, the parents that this is what a good idea that is going to be for them to send their kids to, uh, uh, to school, I, and midway during his spill, three seniors stood up in the aisles and booed him. Well, then that's, that's a protest. Now, what, what is that, what are the consequences for, uh, for, for, uh, of, the, of the protesting? They can either do two things. They will either come up and ask the seniors to leave. If they ask them to leave, they, <coughs> The damage is done in terms of the press because they've already disrupted the meeting. So they, would, so they can leave if they don't want to be arrested. What happens if some say, well, they're not going to leave? What happens then? That means that they're going to have to try to come and bring the stretchers in, and bring the police, 
the seniors are going to just <laughs> going to sit there. That means that the press is going to have to be there to see how they're going to handle the seniors. They're going to have to handle the seniors with kid gloves during the arrest. And all the same time, they have disrupted the whole entire meeting because everyone now is concerned about those seniors. And they protest. And they have protested, and, they, and, and the rationale for their protests uh, is rational, you know. Those are the type of things that I think that, would, that, that the seniors could do. Of course, I mean, we're talking about, you know, those that are able bodies who are willing to do such and that uh, agree that the, that the issue is such that it warrants a disruption of sort, you know. Those are the type of things. And, 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 and let's, put, let's look at it like this. Uh, there is any number of such, those type of demonstrations can take on a life of its own. See, sooner or later, uh, if it's uh, uh, Barbara Finch, you know, if she arrested a couple of times, then of course, whenever they have meetings, they're going to be looking for Barbara Finch, you know. But if Barbara Finch have a couple of her friends, while Barbara Finch is sitting there in the front row, but she got a couple of three other friends that are sitting in the mid uh, row or in the back of the venue, and at this particular meeting, let's say, Barbara Finch will not start the booing. Instead, the booing will come from two or three of her other friends who are sitting back in the, in the back of the, uh, the room or maybe in the middle. It would be better if they would be in the middle because you then have an audience of people in the back as well as in the, in the front. You see, <laughs> so, so you, cra you would become highly effective then, you see. So, but just, just things like that, just, just standing up uh, booing. But I always like for it to be orchestrated. In other words, have a person that will be able to explain why they are in protest, and then, of course, uh, execute it. You know, in some cases, there will be arrest, most cases not. I prefer, really, See, a lot of time when you carry on these activities, the establishment decide not to arrest. But I think it is good therapy for, for, for activists to be arrested so they get a good, firm understanding how the, the so-called justice system is unjust. Number one is that a lot of time they fabricate the cases, they lie, and, 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 and they'll lie on the the subject that is being uh, arrested, uh, what not, you know, things of that nature, you know. Well, that you've given us some great ideas, and I hope that we will be able to think about those and execute them. One of the questions related to the fact that a lot of us are um, older adults and we don't have a lot of stamina, but we can go and sit someplace and we can raise our voices. Yes. And you've given us a wonderful yes. idea. On another topic here, well, it's all related, but here's a question um, about what is going on in Portland, Oregon these days. Um, the question is, peaceful protesters are being picked up by marshals and homeland security and officials thrown into unmarked cars without being told what laws they have broken or why they are being arrested. What can we do to stop this unlawful activity? Well, again, um, um, that is uh, unlawful uh, <coughs> to say the least. And I think that, again, uh, we need to put, uh, we have to go to the streets. I think, you know, marches, if uh, one um, is able to, uh, uh, you know, to organize such. Um, but the most effective, the most effective uh, protests, and I'm not sure whether we have the, the level of support and understanding at this time, would be a general work track whereby you would have, uh, let's say for, 
for a period of three days starting off, and then uh, the following month if uh, things have not been resolved in terms of the government, it, you know, it's to, it's to shut it down, to, uh, to, to, to create a real crisis of a work stoppage. Uh, so let's say, for instance, if this occurred in, um, uh, well, I think that for something of, of that nature, I think that a work stoppage. Now, you're going to have some other people that will say, we have an upcoming election. And then, of course, there's a high probability if people turn out and vote uh, 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 this so-called uh, uncouth, this, this uncouth, incompetent president that we have, vote him out of office, uh, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> that's not going to prevent a lot of uh, problems, but it will certainly eliminate that, that problem, and that would be a major problem, because I think uh, the uh, uh, Biden, there's a high probability that uh, he would not go there or maintain anything like that, you know. This is strictly coming out of, uh, out of a, a president that is uh, desperate, and he, I think basically he wanted to change the um, uh, the news, because you remember his niece had just released this book that was a tell-all pertaining to his behavior. And I think that one way of knocking that off of the front page of the news is for him to commit this unlawful act, uh, you know, to prevent folks from getting additional knowledge as to how they should uh, vote, you know. Thank you. I want to let people know, those who are um, on f watching this on Facebook Live, that they can also send in comments and questions too. So here's a question. There are movements around the country to inject a community voice into collective bargaining negotiations between police unions and cities. Any suggestions for ways we can become effective nuisances for our local police unions and city negotiators to move toward community input? Well, my thinking on that is, number one, organized unions should not uh, recognize police activities as being a union. They are association, they, they claim union, but I think that the first and foremost the working class unions, uh, they should denounce the uh, police from even using the term unions. And this, uh, this is my reasoning. Uh, the, the policemen are more tied to the establishment than they are to the working class or to the people. Sure, they give us that public relation thing about them helping little old ladies across the street and things of that nature. That's public relations. But at the same time, they are the only, they are the only uh, uh, a department or a group or legalized group that can take life and be justified in doing so. And the mere fact that it gets, uh, it, it has, group uh, that, that it has derived, it derived from slavery. That in itself should cause many folks to take another look at the, at the, uh, at, 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 at policemen in general. I mean, the history of how that come about and everything. And the interesting thing is this. It's interesting how the, the wealthy, the wealthy white power structure have used the police apparatus against white working class. They use, they, first of all, it derived from slavery, from uh, you know, runaway slaves or whatnot, and they used this whole apparatus in order to, but then when, when, uh, when the wealthy whites, when the wealthy whites saw that, uh, 
working class whites were becoming more demanding for rights and justice and things of that nature, especially this is visible during the, um, during the, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the organized labor. Then they use the same tactics and means that they use against blacks and keeping blacks in, in, uh, uh, under control or keeping blacks in their place. They use the same method in keeping working class whites in their, in their place or whatnot. You know, uh, it's no accident that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor and the middle class is getting smaller or whatnot, you know. So I think that basically, uh, but, but keep in mind that they use the police, they use the police force in order to maintain the status quo, you see. And I think that it's most important that uh, one thing that, uh, that can be done, and that is organized labor need to denounce uh, uh, policemen using the terms of uh, being union, when in fact they are not union under the definition of the working class. That's one thing. That should be a public thing. And then, of course, uh, the um, uh, policemen should not um, uh, they should not have uh, prosecutor not is it prosecutory uh, immunity one of those immunity they should not be immune to uh, 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 from from their abuse of authority I don't think judges ought to have immunity prosecuting attorneys should not have those immunities either because basic basically they work as a as a uh, as a conspiracy, usually prosecuting attorneys, usually prosecu prosecute, prosecutors, prosecuting attorneys usually accept almost anything that policemen will charge a citizen most of the time. And then usually they run, you know, and, and, and prosecuting attorneys usually are afraid to go against uh, police misbehavior because when it's time for election, they certainly do not want uh, to have the policemen uh, as a group uh, to campaign against them. The same thing holds true with judges. You have judges on the ballot, I mean, for their uh, retention. Uh, many of these judges uh, are, are corrupt as well. But many times one doesn't have a chance to understand that, uh, understand that without having some sort of uh, interaction with the establishment. And that's why it's so important to, uh, to do this, utilizing civil disobedience, which is a nonviolent approach, nonviolent demonstration, but it allows you to go through the, the system. You know, you have to go to court, you have to uh, take the stand, uh, you, you know, you go through that whole entire process, even to the extent of being fingerprinted and all of that. Most people don't get a chance to go through that exercise. And so as a result, all they know about policemen behavior and, um, and uh, these other judiciary um, uh, people is from what they see either on TV but when you get a chance to really see these particular people in action or whatnot, it's a, it's, it's a brand new, I will, I will guarantee you, you'll become a different person because things goes on within the court system and uh, uh, that you never would believe uh, goes on in terms of how things are manipulated and, uh, and especially if you're a protester, you know. So is the only way to find out what goes on be, is to be arrested and go through the whole process? Well, let, let, let's put it like this. <laughs> I think so. I think the best thing is to be arrested. Now, when I, you know, now being arrested is not the worst thing that can happen to a person. I think it's one of the best things that can uh, happen to them in terms of them, uh, in terms of uh, exercising their, their, their knowledge base. I think that basically, 
You can learn from other folks being arrested too if you go, if you're in the court building. You know, if you go and just sit in on some of those particular cases or whatnot and hear some of the, uh, of the argument. But I'm just saying that, let's say for instance, um, let's just say for instance, uh, Barbara, you and I would be arrested uh, doing a sit-in. And of course, you then, the first thing they do is, uh, if you're a senior, they probably will not handcuff you uh, in the back, or they might use the, the plastic uh, things, uh, you know, especially if the press is out there. Uh, but if you are a young person, the first thing, they, they want to handcuff you behind. They may even put the handcuffs on you, and then they will press them and make them exceptionally tight on your wrist. They would almost cut the circulation off. This is what policemen will do, you see? I mean, this is just extra agony, agony to a person when if you got the cuffs on there, you don't have to have them on there that tight where it, it, it cuts off the circulation. But this is what they do to, uh, the, uh, especially if you're a protester, you know. Uh, first of all, you get that, and then of course, um, uh, you'll get some of the verbiage, some of the nasty verbiage uh, that you wouldn't, out of the mouth of a policeman that you wouldn't, uh, you, you wouldn't think that would come from a, a policeman or whatnot, you know. Um, <clears throat> then, of course, uh, then, uh, then, of course, you are bonded. I mean, once you're arrested, then they have to give you a call where you can call someone to make bond, depending upon what you're charged with. In some cases, if it's just general peace disturbance, they can just sign, you can, you can sign a, a summons. You can just, they can give you a summons as to uh, when you come out, uh, when to report to, uh, to court. Um, but I just think that it's, uh, some people, and let me give you a good, ex uh, a good example. Some people have become so frightened being in the court system that they could, when, when, the, when one of the attorneys asked uh, them to state their name, they become so nervous and uptight or whatnot that they couldn't even, they couldn't even uh, call their name. It shows you what, uh, what, what sometimes just that, that the dynamics of such can do to a person. Uh, but uh, I think that once a person go through it or whatnot, it's uh, something that uh, uh, is enlightening to them and for them, you know. I just think it's a good therapy. But if you're gonna do it, do it in a protest model. Not just go out and just be arrested just to be arrested, but I'm talking about, you know, in a protest. Well, that's given but the boo crew is what, I, is what I'm hoping that many folks uh, become uh, very much um, excited about. We're getting a lot of comments here about yay to the Boo Crew idea. They like that a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. So that gives us some ideas. I think we have time for one more question. And but I can stay. I can stay longer now. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we if, let's see what kind of questions yeah. we get. Yeah. But I want I want to be sure to get this one in. And this is from Chris Schmidt, and she says, Mr. Green, you are a brilliant strategist, and the good trouble you instigated resulted in real change. So thank you. What advice would you give to the next generation of activists? Oh, hey, uh, the people are doing what they are doing. I wish, I wish that uh, the I wish I had access to uh, the tools that the, uh, that the youngsters have today. You know, like the internet and uh, the blue tube and all of the, I mean, uh, this is wonderful. I mean, uh, now the thing about it is, and, and then on top of it, I'm, uh, most of them are using it uh, effectively. How to, you know how to organize people, I mean, you see, see, back in the day, we didn't have, we couldn't go on the internet and then 
uh, or face uh, Facebook and to uh, ask people to come to a particular uh, a rally or a demonstration. We didn't have that. We were at the mercy. We was at the mercy of sending a press release out to the news media. The news media had the option on whether they thought that it was that it was uh, newsworthy or not. And so a lot of a tremendous number of good demonstrations were had, had, had been organized, but the news media hadn't show, didn't show up because the white power structure in a decision making manner decided that it wasn't newsworthy. And so consequently, the community at that time was not able to, um, uh, <clears throat> they was unaware of such, you know, or, or it would have been the same if it was a, a particular issue. I mean, you was at the mercy, now, <laughs> but they, with the internet and the way it's being utilized now, it is fantastic. I just only wish that uh, it was back during that particular time. We had mimeograph machines. We had, of course, the telephone, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, things like that, you know, <laughs> old, uh, uh, outdated, but it's been updated to some degree. But the thing about it is, uh, there is, uh, there has been, uh, I, I, what, uh, the same thing that is, uh, that we were doing then is being done now, it's just that, uh, they had different tools, you know, to be, to be effective. So I think, um, um, I think rallies, of course, now with the, uh, with the, the, the coronavirus, uh, being inactive, that put a damper on a whole bunch of things uh, now. But um, I think um, um, anything that, I think, a, <clears throat> I don't think a demonstration is effective. I don't think a demonstration, um, I think the only demonstrations that are effective are the ones that disrupt, you know. Uh, if, it's not, if, if the demonstration is not uh, moving some people out of their comfort zone, then of course I don't think it's, uh, it's being effective. It has to force a person to think about something that they would not ordinarily be thinking about. Percy Green, you've given us a lot to think about and I'm going to close with a quote from a woman named Diva Woodley who is Associate Professor of Politics at the New School in New York. And she writes, whether you are comfortable joining a protest movement, a march, or an event that might turn messy, realize that this is often the way that goals are achieved. The whole purpose of protest is to interrupt your daily life, to interrupt the previously scheduled programming, so you can pay attention to something new. Yeah, well, but, check, but, but check this out though. Here's one other thing that we have to think, be, 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 uh, be thoughtful of. Poor people are not poor by choice. Poor people are not poor by choice. The other thing we have to be conscious of, and that is we didn't choose our parents either. We didn't choose our parents. We could have just as easily, I, we're here as a result of a crapshoot. Boom. Yeah. So we have to be mindful, uh, mindful, mindful of that, of these things that we have control over versus things that we, we don't have control over. And then, of course, I mean, uh, and then uh, we have to be mindful of, uh, we are animals. And you can push, uh, you know, you, many examples of animals can only be pushed so far before they have to go into a survival mode. So here are a couple more things about the Boo Crew. Sign me up for the Boo Crew and let's all go get arrested. And I think <laughs> it's one o'clock, it's time to end this. This has been the most stimulating interesting, thought-provoking 
lunch and learn that we have had. And I want to thank Percy Green for showing up and sharing with us his way of doing civil disobedience and inspiring us to make change in the world that we know needs to change. Thank you, Percy, and thanks to everybody who's tuned in today. Well, I'm so sorry that we didn't get a chance to answer everybody's questions. I hope uh, we may have to, especially after all of this, this uh, corona action is over with, maybe we can do something then and do the mission. Yeah. <laughs> do a boo cruise.